welcome. It's so good to have you here. Thank you so much for coming over and spending time with me as I gush and geek over the genus Coilus stylus, of which at this point I have three. As you can see, we are somewhat distant from the main part of the attraction, which are the blooms, but I'll get to all of that. And I hope that you enjoyed this video. There's a few things other than the gorgeous blooms that I would like to bring to your attention. The genus Coilostylus was split off the supergenus Epidendrum back in 2004. Now, Epidendrum is something that was every single epiphyte orchid back in the day. So throughout the centuries, they have been all reclassified. Just imagine once upon a time, a Cattleya was Epidendrum. And now we have a lot, a lot of genus and Coilostylus was removed from the supergenus Epidendrum because of certain features that we might not be able to see in the naked eye, but with a little bit of a closer look, we will be able to define them. You would think that Coilostylus being its own genus now would also be a reason because of the growth habit, but you can see that every single one of my Coilostylus has a completely different growth habit. We'll get to that as well. And yet they are all Coilostylus. So on the right, you will see the Coilostylus ciliare, which is the type species of the Coilostylus genus, and it's also called the fringe star orchid. Coilostylus or steadii on the left. Here's where my confusion came in in the early days, and maybe you came across a similar kind of situation, and I hope this video clears that up. My confusion was that it's sometimes cited as Epidendrum ciliare variety or steadii, and I have called that like that on my channel a lot. Except I don't use Epidendrum, I say Coilostylus ciliare variety or steadii. Now that is not true. I still have to force myself, make a conscious effort to call it Coilostylus or steadii, and I will tell you why. Coilostylus parkinsoniana, which is in the middle, pride of place. It's like winning the Olympics, positions one, two, and three. This Coilostylus is sometimes called Epidendrum parkinsonianum. So if you are on the market and you're seeing Epidendrum parkinsonianum, Epidendrum variety or steady eye, Epidendrum, something like that, but you see the blooms here and you say, I want me one of them, or what is my real name? Know that even to this day, they have the synonym Epidendrum and then, of course, following on that, the species identity. Let me take you to why the left Coilostylus cannot be called Ciliare variety or Steadii. Why is it only called Coilostylus or Steadii? Because the lateral lobes on the blooms are not ciliate and that is where ciliare comes from. So what does ciliate refer to and how can we be sure to know what we're looking at? The definition of ciliate is with a fringe of fine hairs. You see where I'm getting at? The Coilostylus ciliare on the right is the type genus, has ciliare in it, referring to ciliate, with a fringe of fine hairs. Whereas when we look at the blooms of the Coilostylus or Steadii, we do not see any fringes around the lobes on the lip. Now, because of the diverse growth habit of these orchids, you would probably think that, well, Coilostylus ciliare could be a cattleya. And then you think that the Coilostylus or steadii, that is also very, very cattleya-like. But the rhizomes are completely different. We won't even address what the Parkinsoniana is doing because completely different once again. But once these orchids are in bloom, they can be identified to fit into the Coilostylus genus because the blooms feature a trilobate lip joined to the column with a thin midlobe. So everything that protrudes beautifully is all part of the lip and how it is joined to the column. That makes this a Coilostylus. Even though we are seeing growth patterns that are completely different from each other. It is the blooms that determine a Coilostylus genus. I'm gonna throw a little bit of a tangent in here now. I have a Rincodendrum caragata en verde. That is a primary hybrid of Coilostylus ciliare crossed with Rincolalia digbiana, but it is called Rincodendrum caragata en verde. So I'm just putting it out there. <laughs> Expect a name change coming soon at some point in time because we're not talking about Epidendrum ciliare as the parent anymore. We're talking 
Coil of Stylus Ciliare as the parent. Fun times, hey? <laughs> it's all in the name, you know. Now, the beauty about the Coil of Stylus genus is not just the variety of growth habit. They still require exactly the same amount of care, even though their growth habit is so varied. Being thermophilic makes them warm to hot growers. Their preferred lowest temperatures is 16 degrees Celsius. However, in my environment, they tolerate a 14 degrees Celsius low. The Parkinsoniana and the Ciliare are doing great holding on when those temperatures do happen. The Orsedii throws a little bit of a strop and that's why I do have some cold damage on the tip of leaves. They would prefer to have a humidity of 85% all year round and that explains why most of them start growing their roots during the hottest months of the year because in their natural habitat it's hot it's humid and they can sustain all the root growth in that environment this is where in culture a little bit of a fandangle has to happen if you are not in a controlled environment where you can provide 85 percent humidity all year round plus 16 degrees Celsius and up of temperature. This is in culture where your setup makes a difference of how well you can grow these orchids. And for that reason, I have opted for LECA and self-watering because my humidity levels here in Southern Spain are so low, I really can't actually say I have any humidity to speak of. For that reason, LECA and self-watering provides a lot of humidity that is concentrated around each and every pot. So the leaves are not that stressed when it comes to the warm, dry winds. Of course, a lot of flushing goes on. Of course, a lot of watering goes on. And that is normal because it is their grow season. Usually my Orstedii starts to throw out roots in August, which of course, here in Spain, we can reach temperatures of 40 degrees and up. And this orchid is in heaven, just like I am when it gets that hot. But no humidity makes my setup a necessity or else I would stand no chance of growing roots whatsoever. The ciliare is already in root production, full on root production. And here we are in July. So this setup works really, really well for dry climates with very low humidity, but have the heat to match what these orchids love. Now, when it comes to heat, do not mistake that or confuse that with light or sunlight. They can tolerate direct sun. As you can see, my Orsteady eye right now as I'm filming is in direct sun, but I've got plenty of airflow at the moment. I do, however, protect all of them from direct sun for the majority part of June, July, August, and September. I have no resources in my climate that would help reduce the heating up of the leaves if I expose them to direct sun because, again, my wind also matches my outdoor temperature and that certainly is not cooling. So if they get some direct sun early in the morning, that's fine. Very late in the afternoon, that's fine. Bearing in mind that late in the afternoon, everything is hot. So even that I would be very careful of if you don't have natural airflow. But early morning, it's still all a little bit cooler, a little bit fresher definitely no direct sun during the hottest months of the year. Even though they are warm to hot growers, there is a difference. They grow in shady, canopied rainforest. That tells you everything you need to know. They have a lot of bright light, dappled light sometimes, but rarely do they get hit with direct sun. So my Parkinsoniana and my Ciliare, they live in my blooming alley because they get the permanent shade, but it is south facing, so they get a lot, a lot of light. And they need that high light in order for them to bloom. My Orstedii is my little nomadic Coilostylus. It occupies the patio wherever there is shade based on the time of day. But that doesn't mean that I make sure that the orientation of the pot is still directed according to where the light comes from. Moving these or orchids around or any orchid for that matter can be a form of stress because the orchid has to redirect where is my light source. You can easily avoid that by placing your pot in a different location but orientating it towards whatever light source is the strongest. And that is why my Orsteady eye is staying in the pot despite the characteristic of its climbing rambling rhizome. So when we speak of the growth habit, 
I've got the Orstedii with a rambling rhizome and a little bit of a climbing habit. Then I've got the Parkinsoniana, which looks nothing like the other two when it comes to leaf shape <laughs> and how it grows. Yet that is in a Lekka and self-watering pot as well. So you could call that a bit of a rambler. And then I've got the Ciliaro, which looks like a Cattleya bolt upright in the pot with a somewhat lengthy rhizome, but it really, really is a wonderful orchid that grows like beautiful candles in the pot. It's, it's marvelous. Each of them are being light trained according to their growth habit. The one that doesn't really work well with the light training is the Parkinsoniana, and I have resorted to understanding that this orchid one day will need its own little pedestal because I'm trying to protect damage on the leaves. All of them are nocturnally fragrant, and that is reflected in the color of their blooms. They're not showy. They don't have many colors. They have an understated elegance. But that is because during the day, they're not in the business of getting pollinated. At night, however, that is the time that you want to be going outside if you have one of these orchids and inhale the perfume. Coincidentally, not planned, but coincidentally, pride of place when it comes to fragrance and how strong and how wide the ranges of the fragrance, gold medal goes to Parkinsoniana. Intense fragrance. Everything's a little bit soapy, but on the citrusy, vanilla kind of side. Not that sweet, but there is a combination in there that makes you get closer and closer to the bloom and that's when you find a little bit of soapy and a little bit of sugary notes in the fragrance. But if you are far, far away from this orchid, I would say at least four meters, you can still smell her and it is intoxicatingly beautiful. And no wonder a pollinator would come up and deal with that fragrance straight away. Citrusy vanilla. In second place, the silver medal when it comes to fragrance and intensity is, in actual fact, the Coilostylus ciliare. And she has a very similar fragrance, but it is much more towards a sweet side of citrus. If these orchids live close by to each other, you will not be able to appreciate the ciliare fragrance because the Parkinsoniana is that much more intense. I have to take the pot away, distance myself from the Parkinsoniana, and then I can appreciate the fragrance of the ciliare, which also has that gorgeous citrus vanilla note to it, and a little bit more on the sweeter side. The Orstedii I found is the weakest of the fragrances this year, because I only got three blooms. She hated my cold spring, and maybe that's why we didn't get more blooms on other growths, even though she's a very vigorous grower, but her fragrance also resembles very much the ciliare, a little bit more on the sweeter side of citrus and vanilla. These are well worth getting up and outside for at night to be able to experience their individual fragrances. Meanwhile, if the Parkinsoniana was the only one in bloom, I can stay indoors in my living room and I can smell her. <laughs> she is just incredible. When it comes to the bloom duration, first place when it comes to how long these blooms last, that I had one year and they lasted three months. I was like, are you fake? Are you plastic? What's going on here? No complaints, but it was a three month duration that I enjoyed my Parkinsoniana. The other two are not as long lived. Four weeks, maybe five weeks, depending on how hot it is, how dry it is, if you have higher humidity, then your blooms will probably last about five to six weeks. I found it very odd that my Orstedii, the first two blooms that opened, one of them turned yellow relatively quickly, whereas the other ones are still holding on beautifully. The yellow one shows no signs of dropping off whatsoever. So I'm just going to conclude that was because of the intense, consistent, persistent dry wind that I was having when that one first bloom opened. That's the only reason I can think of because it, it isn't collapsing as if it was pollinated. Anyway, if you were confused about Coilus stylus and you're seeing all the different growth habits, <laughs> I hope that this video was helpful and you can go ahead and buy a Coilus stylus knowing that they can tolerate, don't like, but can tolerate temperatures that are maybe a little bit lower than what you read in the books.
I am fertilizing gung-ho on all of them. Because of their size, because of their growth habit, everybody is at this point in time getting 300 parts per million of fertilizer. Has nothing to do whether they're in bloom or not. I am just encouraging the growths that are still under development to progress. The Parkinsoniana is forming a keiki that needs to get some strength in it. That keiki is also growing a new growth. My usual regime of supplements is calcium, magnesium, and seaweed at a concentration of 100 parts per million. However, I have 60 parts per million of CalMag and 40 parts per million of seaweed. They get all the same, no matter their size. If you have any questions that I did not cover while I was gushing about these orchids, let me know in the comments. I love talking about them, love hearing from you. Do you grow them? Do you have any? Are they blooming for you this time of year as well? I can never get enough of Coilostylus, so bring on the comments. <laughs> I really appreciate the time you took watching the video. Thank you very, very much. And I will now be moving my Coilostylus back into bright shade because it's getting a little bit warm and toasty out here. <laughs> have yourselves a beautiful day on one condition though, that you stay safe. Take care. Bye.